Gabby Petito, part 15.2, Laundry, Dead. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. As a consequence of the fact that I'm a narcissistic psychopath and know my kind inside out, and also know the inner workings of our victims, as a consequence of needing to understand my prey, I'm able to analyse certain situations so that I can provide you with advanced and detailed understanding as to the mindsets and behaviours of the people involved as a consequence of the dynamic between narcissist and victim. And in keeping with that, I'm providing you with my observations following the recent revelation that Brian Laundrie has been found dead. In part 15.1, I explained to you why he murdered her, what caused that to happen. I now continue addressing various key questions to aid your understanding. Please ensure that you like this video before you go any further and remember to share it far and wide. A pertinent question is why did Laundry go missing after he had murdered Gabby Petito? Well of course at the simplest level was that he had done something wrong and therefore he needed to ensure that he distanced himself from the scene of the crime so that he wouldn't be caught. But it goes further than that, because one needs to understand why he behaved as he did as a consequence of the type of narcissist that he is, or rather, that he was. Having murdered Gabby Petito, he would not be struck with any sensation of remorse, guilt or conscience, because he has none. As a narcissist, he has no emotional empathy. He did not plan to murder her. His murder, the act of the murder was as a consequence of a burst of ignited fury that led him to assert control with physical violence. It may well be the case that he just wanted to frighten her, but having in essence become so furious, he throttled her to death. Thereafter, he would have experienced the receipt of tremendous amounts of fuel from Gabby Petito as she died, the bulging eyes, the attempts to free herself from his grip, the strangulated noises, all would have fueled him. He would also have got control over her because she was now dead. However, shortly thereafter, the threat to control would manifest, namely the realisation that he had killed her and what that meant. And therefore, this amounted to a threat to control. This caused him to take certain steps to flee where he was, because quite simply he is a coward. And as part of the ad attempt to assert control over the perception of what had occurred, this caused him to withdraw from where it had taken place and of course return home without Gabby Petito. There are significant question marks about how much was conveyed to his parents what they know about what went on, whether they knew that he'd killed her, whether they aided and abetted him in some form of escape thereafter. And those are matters which will be addressed subsequently. Having returned home, Gab um, Bram Laundrie then departed again and purportedly was not seen for some time thereafter, indeed not seen again by his parents, for instance, if their testimonies are to be relieved. He then went on the run in order to escape the repeated threat to control. And the problem that Brian Laundry had was that each day he would be reminded of the fact that he had murdered his fiancée, and therefore that would amount to a threat to control. It's also the case that he will have kept abreast of reports that he was a person of interest. And therefore, the fact that the FBI and various other law enforcement agencies wanted to speak to him also amounted to threats to control. He, as one man, was never in a position to rip off his shirt, beat his chest and go Rambo style on law enforcement. So he could not nullify the threat to control posed by the manhunt by taking them all down single-handedly. Of course, there are some narcissists that attempt to do that. Those are the ones which are equipped invariably with a number of weapons and end up in a shootout before being killed. That was not applicable 
with Laundry, given the type of narcissist that he is. And instead, he couldn't assert control, of course, directly. With regard to the indirect assertion of control, it may well be the case that he used this, for instance, saying to his parents, I don't know where she is. We've had an argument. She's gone away. She's disappeared. I don't know what's happened. And they may well have been taken in by this. And their acceptance of what he explains means that they don't threaten his sense of control. And in that moment, it allows the narcissism to feel a sense of control over the ongoing threat posed by the fact that he is murdered. Gabby Petito. The significant difficulty that he had was that at repeated instances he would be reminded of the fact that this is what he had done. Do not confuse this with thinking that he was tortured by his conscience. He's not. He's tortured by the repeated threats to control posed by the fact that he has committed a criminal act because he is aware that what he did is viewed as wrong. In his mind, it was justified. In his mind, it was justified because she had pushed him too far, that she had attacked him, for instance. We saw shades of that in the body cam footage that I've analysed separately. If Laundry had submitted to arrest and trial, or if he had been caught, it's likely that the defence would either have been that she disappeared and he didn't know what happened to her, or she attacked him and he defended himself and it went too far and that he involuntarily caused her death. His narcissism would drive him to do that because it would rewrite history in order to protect him by rejecting the threat to control posed by criminal proceedings against him to suggest that he was culpable for her death. And therefore he would have pled not guilty. He would not have put his hands up to the matter. However, as we know, it didn't get that far. And instead, because of the repeated reminders of this, his narcissism caused him to assert control through withdrawal. He went on the run. There was suggestion that he might have attempted to get to another country that didn't have an extradition agreement with the United States. That clearly wasn't achieved. And this was because it was beyond the wit and remit of this particular type of narcissist. He didn't have access to the relevant assets, networks or resources that would enable him to achieve that. And instead, rather than him actually have some kind of master plan as to what he was going to do, his narcissism was dealing with the matter on an ad hoc basis, causing him to try and stay away from the repeated threats to control by opting for the third assertion of control, withdrawal. And therefore, he went missing after killing Gabby Petito because his narcissism drove him into a position of withdrawal to nullify the sustained and repeated threats to control posed by the fact that he was a wanted man, or at least a person of interest. Thus, he disappeared into the national parks in Florida, on his own, away from people. And therefore, the next question that falls to be addressed is, did Brian Laundry experience a fuel crisis whilst on the run. Fuel is required by all narcissists and we obtain it in different ways through different interactions with different layers of potency dependent on people's position within the fuel matrix. In order to understand more about this fascinating subject I would very much encourage you to read my book Fuel which you'll find in the Knowledge Vault or on Amazon. It'll explain a lot for you. Where we're deprived of fuel, the narcissist will experience a fuel crisis, and that leads to psychotic episodes, it leads to neglect, self-harm, and going into effect into a stupor, as the chasm and the emptiness and the creature within consumes the narcissist. It is not unreasonable to think perhaps Brian Laundrie experienced this because he was on his own in the middle of nowhere. Well, we know for a period of time, of course, that he would have had some interaction with other human beings, and therefore those interactions, whether good or bad, will have provided him with fuel to sustain him. But it's evident that he was staying well away from people. It might have been that there were individuals that were helping him, perhaps with provision of supplies. 
And therefore, if that was the case, he would have some limited human interaction, which would again provide him with fuel. But that would not be repeated. It seems to me, however, that Brian Laundry had been equipped, either him having achieved this or with assistance, that he was able to monitor what was going on in the world around him with regard to the manhunt and what was going on on social media. And therefore, he will have seen the frenzy of comments, observations, accusations, broadcasts, all of which will have provided him with some fuel. Now, the comments of people on social media, the news reports, etc., all come from tertiary sources, so it wouldn't be the most potent, and much of it was in the written word, which is only a small amount of fuel. Furthermore, if he had watched broadcasts, listening to him being spoken about, will, of course, provided him with a larger amount of fuel. But he would need to have been substantially fueled by physical interaction. When we interact with you in person, that gives us the largest amount of fuel. Hence, why narcissists invariably want to spend time with you. For Laundry, he will have had a diminished fuel situation. I suspect that he perhaps wasn't quite in fuel crisis, but it was certainly low. And this would not have helped him. This would have caused increased paranoia. Naturally, he knows that he's a wanted man, and therefore his innate paranoia would have increased all the more without the calming effect of fuel. It would have caused him, in instances, to become disorientated, perhaps not thinking straight, until he was able to garner some fuel. But also, his own arrogance and the belief that he was better than anybody else caused him to find some delight in inverted commas that he was evading law enforcement, that he was beyond their reach, and therefore that would have provided him with thought fuel also. Thought fuel is really the scraps of the fuel world. We can't survive on it alone. It's almost like the fumes inside the, end, the fuel tank of the car when you're running on empty. It provides a degree of sustainability, but not for long. And we have to get that proximate fuel. Talking to somebody in person, receiving text messages, a telephone call, uh, reading messages about ourselves, and of course including broadcast also. It's evident that Laundry will have experienced diminished fuel levels, but I don't think that he was quite at the point of crisis. Join me in part three as I answer further key questions arising out of the recent news that Brian Laundry has been found dead. <laughs>